Good afternoon. Good morning. I don't even know. <laughs> well, hello, Shenandoah. It's class of what? 20... 2023. Who's counting, right? <laughs> Welcome. I'm so excited to be here. Can you all see me when I stand down here? Or do I? I've not been blessed with height. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm so glad to be here. I'm excited to share with you my story. Um, no pressure. So they said I'm the first one. So everybody else, I don't have to compete with anyone. So that's kind of exciting. What you see today is um, the first thing. So in addition to my story, I want to share three things. So if you forget everything you hear today, I want you to remember these three. Value, purpose, and community. Okay, value, purpose, and community. You didn't even know you were coming to class today. So those are the three things I want you to walk away with because those are the lessons that have informed my life up to this point. And I also want to share a little bit about me. One, I'm a crier. I cry about everything, good, bad, happy, sad. So when you see that up here, don't be concerned. That's just who I am. That's how I express myself. And as she mentioned, I'm a therapist, so I'm very comfortable with feelings. So if anybody wants to cry with me, that's okay too. Um, but also because I share really, really intense information and some of the stories might be triggering, I do wanna put that out there now. If you feel like this is a little too much for you, um, feel free to walk out and give yourself some time. And I'll also hang around afterwards if anybody wants to come and talk to me. So I wanted to put that out there. It's, sometimes it can be a lot for a person. Okay, so now I'll jump in after all that explaining. Um, I talked about value, and as I go through this, um, I want to just show a little, it's kind of corny and probably you all have seen it on so social media somewhere, but it brings a point across for me, and I've not seen anything else that kind of informs that for me. So we're going to pretend this is $100, all right? Who would want $100? Oh, right, me too. <laughs> so I would want hundred dollars, and what would that buy? Um, you say Apple something? Oh, sure, I can. <laughs> right, you could buy a lot of things, right? So if I got this hundred dollars and just crumpled it up, how much would it be? Still hundred dollars, and who would still want it? Right, it would still buy whatever. Apple something. I don't think anything in Apple buys $100. <laughs> you can buy $100. If I were to throw it on the floor and just step on it, how much is it? Right? You'll still want it, right? And what I want you to take out of this in the stories I'm going to tell and about ourselves that we usually forget, our value is not determined by the things we go through. Who would still want this $100? Right because it did not change. So no matter what your background has been, no matter what you hear and see about these girls and women, who they are and who you are, you are priceless. Your worth was given to you at birth, and no matter what happens, messages you get, it does not change who you are. You're still worthy and you're still valuable no matter what happens, right? So these girls, this work, how it started, um, before I jump all the way there, I just wanted to bring that in as value, and that's the core of this whole message, right? So I'm here because of my sister from another mister, Amy. Um, and as she already mentioned how we met, I won't go into all of that. But this will come back to show you about community. If you live in your value and in your purpose, the universe will just work together to make your purpose come through, through community. So without Amy, I wouldn't be talking to each and every one of you who will go on to tell more people, who will go on to change the world later on. So don't forget the people in your life. Those who have got you where you are, nobody gets where they are alone, right? If you did, let us know what you had to do so we can all learn from you. Um, so my family, that's my husband in the middle, our oldest, my bonus son, Nicholas, who is 17, going on 30. I have twin girls who are six and have taught me more than I needed to learn about life because they're also little teenagers. And a seven-year-old, Nolan. And those are the people who keep me grounded. Um, and those are my siblings that have also shaped who I am. And so as they mentioned, I'm, I was born in Rwanda 
um, grew up in Uganda, and having this constant support in my life has been able to guide me. So family is everything to me. All right, so unfortunately we have to start with this because there have been people who think it's a country, right? So Africa is not a country, and the country I'm talking about is Uganda, which is in East Africa. And the work that we do is somewhere, oh, I don't remember what they showed me that little pointer thing is. There it is. So the work we do is right there, almost at the uh, border of Rwanda in Uganda. And it's a little village called Nyaka. And that village had had, well, the whole Uganda, HIV AIDS epidemic that wiped out a whole generation. Then my husband came in and started schools for these orphans. But what they didn't know is that once you start one thing, it leads to another. And you will hear more about this when he speaks on Monday. But, so they started out as just a school, and the kids were hungry, so they started a farm to feed them. And then these kids get sick, what do you do? So they started free clinics. Oh, but now water is not clean enough, so they started clean water. And every uh, situation that came up, they started something to do it, to deal with it. So in 2015, a group from Shenandoah University shows up in this village to do some good work. And while they're there, they're doing sex education, they're volunteering, and something came out. A girl um, anonymously wrote, I think the question was about stressors, everyday stressors. And this girl said one of her stressors is being raped every night. But they didn't know who had written this. So we're like, okay, this is obviously a problem. Let's go ask these teachers. So I came in soon after they left and were asking teachers, okay, do you hear anything? What are some of the traumas? I'm coming in with my therapist hat. How can we help these girls? And um, very nonchalantly, this teacher says, oh yeah, there's a nine-year-old in class. She was raped yesterday. It just happens. Exactly, I see your face. That was me like, we'll say what? <laughs> Nothing happened? And it turns out in Uganda, if you're a survivor, victim of this crime, you have to pay the police. Can you imagine if you had to pay the police to look into a crime? And you have to pay about $12. If you don't have that money, even if you have evidence, nothing is happening. And you go, they're walking at least seven miles. So you go to the police, you pay them, they go on to look for this perpetrator. Then you walk maybe 10 miles to the doctor, you pay $5 to get a rape kit or any kind of medical assistance. They fill out a form, you walk the other seven miles back to the police and provide your own evidence from the hospital. And I had no idea this is what happens. I was like, this is not okay. So we took care of this girl and we did what we had to do. I'm like, all right, we did this, we're good. All is done. And afterwards, that same week, we're still there. This girl comes up, say, I heard what you did for this girl. And I've been a survivor, I've been a victim since I was four. And my dad has been doing this and nowhere to go. It's like, okay, what is going on? Okay, we paid, we took care of her, we sent her to boarding school because stigma is so high in this community that everywhere she went, they called her names and boys taunted her. So we sent her out of the community and took care of the family and the mother and all of this, like, all right, we're good. I kid you not, same week, um, a grandmother comes with her five-year-old, and this is what broke me. This little five-year-old, those are all the Nyaka kids. It had just happened, grandpa was the perpetrator and he was HIV positive. And because she couldn't afford $5 in that 72 hour, so this girl became HIV positive too. And I'm thinking, I'm a Starbucks addict. I spend at least that much on a cup of coffee every day. And that's this girl's life. And I don't know about you all, but I could not live in a world where this is okay. And it turns out, because of corruption, they didn't consider this a crime. They would say it's a family matter. So they would get the perpetrator and the victim to work it out. And what happened was the perpetrator would offer a goat to the guardians as an apology. And so in 2015, we're telling girls, you are worth a goat. 
remember that value. We're telling them your value is that of a goat. And that was not going to happen on my watch. So in that time, I'm thinking, okay, I have four kids. It was like 20 some days. I was in school. I was working and a wife. Like, I don't have time. I can't do this. And you know, when you've been called to do something, it doesn't matter how far you run, it doesn't matter which way you take, it comes and finds you. So for me, it came as a clear voice that said, why do you get the luxury to wait when they're hurting now? Because I thought, I'll come back when I'm more qualified, when I'm Dr. So-and-so and I have something to offer. But it was obviously my call to come and do something. And we each have a calling on our lives. It's gonna look different than mine. It might not be across the world, but you all are here for a purpose. And when you tune into that voice, you will find your purpose. So my purpose came to me in this form, a form of three girls in a span of three, two weeks to tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. So that's what started EJA. We said, I don't have money. I don't have a way to do this. What can we do? Just because you don't have resources right now doesn't mean you can't do anything. So we went to a hospital and said, just give us one room, that's all I need. And initially, I got just one volunteer. She said, you don't have to pay me. This is a big problem, I'll do whatever you need me to do. I didn't pay her for six months of, of work. So we got a social worker and we got a legal advocate. And what that looks like, we got a little room that we call the healing center. We got a, that's the social worker and the uh, legal advocate. And so when somebody calls and they've been through such a horrendous event, there's someone there to say, I believe you. It's not your fault. How can I support you? If you ever come across somebody who's been through this, remember those three words. Research shows when you do see someone in that who is supportive in the first 24 hours of such an event, it can change how you heal. So somebody's job, the only thing that could change their trajectory of healing is, I believe you, it's not your fault, how can I support you? And that's what these people do. So what happens before EJA, that's how they would transport a perpetrator. That guy up front is the perpetrator. The police officer would just walk them to jail. Um, so if he's not bribed, he's, just, he's not doing all of that. He's not that invested. So they would stop doing their work because it's too difficult. So Edja came in and said, okay, we'll give you a motorcycle. So we have a legal advocate who will go pick up the police officer, go pick up the perpetrator, and the three of them will huddle up on that little motorcycle for one long, awkward ride all the way to jail. So we didn't have to wait till we can afford a car or a police van or whatever they use. You can start with what you have. And because of this, we have put away over 40 perpetrators just with one motorcycle. And that five-year-old girl I talked about, the grandfather got 32 years in prison. <laughs> That was the first of its kind in this community because before they would either bribe their way through it or, but the other thing it does, it tells this girl, you're not worth a goat. You're worth fighting for. We see your value. So because I'm on a cycle, now we're able to do that. We're able to walk with these girls because when they don't have this paperwork, the case gets dismissed. So now the legal advocate makes sure all the paperwork is there. They show up at every court case until it's all done. So when I'm talking about a police station, really, sometimes it's just that little tiny house. Um, so we're working in a very remote, poor area, but the main thing is to start changing the culture, and including transporting the people, including the witnesses, so that this work can be done. And with therapy, we don't have the fancy rooms, probably the counseling center here that you have, or all these trained people. All it takes is a conversation. Sometimes it's behind their house, sometimes it's in their garden, anywhere we can find them to just remind them that they are worth fighting for and someone is going to do that. So our counselor does home visits, school visits. Um, we educate the parents on how to support them through this. 
we also then found that some girls get pregnant because of rape. And in Uganda, can you imagine when you start school, every girl has to go to the clinic and get a pregnancy test. And if you are positive, or if there's any indication that you've ever had a child or an abortion, you're automatically thrown out of school. And the boys, of course, they keep going, right? So even when it's by rape, these girls then all, right away they're out of school, right away they're disowned by their families because now they're, um, they're bringing shame to the family even when they've been raped. So Aja came in and started supporting their, their girls and their daughters and all of um, the process. So we've been able to help girls walk through this healing and because of that we also started workshops because you can't support just the healing without changing the culture. And we even still see it here in the United States where we're still very backwards in how we support and how people understand this. And this is not a work for just women. We have to include our men. And I'm happy to report, finally, we got a boy to report an assault this a couple of years ago, because we know it happens. One in six boys and men are survivors, but they don't have space because there's so much stigma. So we want to also include everyone who, to have a voice in this healing process. We've trained grandmothers and fathers and um, teachers uh, to see how to change this culture because the gender roles are still backwards. We still have, in one of the workshops, we're talking about marital rape and this one of the town council people who just raised his hands like, what do you mean? Women don't even know when they want to have sex. It's our job as men to help them or to force them. And I'm, like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> so that was kind of the understanding we had. But because of this work, we started training the young ones the older ones to see and make a culture shift. We go to radio now and put on a show on the resources and what kind of um, support you have in the community and how we can change that. And we have seen, we have started to see people understand and change and come on with us a, a, along this journey because we believe enough is enough. And it's time for a change. And if it's not with us, then who, right? And so, um, because of this, just starting something, and this comes back to you as freshmen, your whole career is ahead of you and your whole life is ahead of you and everything is possible. And things, the more you go, they get a little more complex and a little more gray and sometimes you wonder. But when you just listen to that purpose that you were all given, your community will come behind you. So when I started this work, I had no idea where I was going to get the money, where I was going to do all this. And one person would make an introduction to another, and another to another. And then I got the Global Citizen Award, it was $50,000, that was huge for us. So we opened another healing center in another rural area. And just now we just got more money, now we have four. And because of this, another person then at that event comes up to me and says, would you like to come speak at the Vatican? And I'm like, Vatican, Michigan? And he goes, no, in Rome. I'm like, what the hell? Is, are you sure? You know, so those are the things that once you start just doing what you're called to do, other things will fall in place. So don't wait till you have everything that you have always dreamed of. Well, that degree, you can make a difference where you are with what you have as long as you are open to it. So, because of that, our first walk was last year. We had the whole community come together and say, let's walk to end gender-based violence. And we had 1,500 1, people walk with us. The police now, who started off wanting bribes, they're now the ones leading this walk. We have grandmothers and kids, and this is our second one. So then this summer, we went back and we said, let's open in another community and do another walk so we can reach more people. And this year, we got 3,500 people joined the walk. And look at that. And girls and boys, and they're sitting out in this hot sun and just stayed there the whole time because they're invested now in their community. 
And they got to understand that change starts with them, not this random woman who comes in and tells them, yeah, we're going to do something about it. But now they believe that they also can change their own community. And believe it or not, those are all little survivors. We have as young as four. So this was not OK. And we, are, we were here to say, we're going to turn victims into victors and to also get them to understand and revisit their value. So on this note, I'm going to um, get to a short video that has now turned into a documentary. Hopefully, one of these days, we will bring it over here. Perpetrators who target the poor, poor girls in deep, deep remote areas, that is not the reason that they should go away freely. In this community, there is this thinking that when you rape a girl, no one is going to care. Just because this girl is from a very poor family. Some of the people would think, well, if a girl is raped, yeah, it's sad, but it was eventually her role. It just only happened too early. It is what it is. Before Eja came in, people were not coming out to talk about these defilement and rape cases, child abuse in most cases. The Me Too movement was so necessary for all of us to have a stage and to have a platform. For Uganda, it's a whole different kind of platform because it's life and death for these girls. You don't have money, an arrest is not happening. You don't have money, you're not getting a rape kit. And we're talking about people, some of them living on less than a dollar. This five-year-old could have been HIV free right now if she had five dollars. For me, my conviction was why do I get the luxury to wait when they're hurting right now? And so we got up and we had to do something about it. I am Tabitha from America Guri, Edja founder. Our cultures are embedded with so many things that we have to take apart one at a time to give girls and women the full agency to who they are, to their bodies, to to themselves. So far what has worked the best is involving the community from day one because they see that they're part of the solution. Our social worker is Brenda, but the word social worker is just a title. I don't have words to explain what Brenda does and who she is other than superwoman. Out of the so many that don't believe them, we do. We believe they're victims and we know that they are worth their lives. This girl is hurt and she needs healing. She knew the man was HIV positive and at a certain point she had me and Bosco in the community and she was happy that she came in time. Victims of this violence, the girls and women who have overcome this trauma, my wife calls them victors. Girls were not getting anybody to listen to them on any level. And so we got a legal advocate. And our first one is Bosco. Because of his work, this man wakes up in the middle of the night. Whenever they call him, he drops everything and runs to the rescue of these girls. The victors know that somebody's going to do something about this. He goes to each and every court session. He makes connections with not only the police, but all the way to the judges. We are seeing so many changes. And I think I have way more hope in this next generation that they're getting education. They're seeing that there are no limits to what girls can do as what boys can do.
AJ this week has been absolutely incredible. We had a walk of over a thousand people, students, teachers, grandmothers, police officers. The whole community came together to just say we're taking a stand that enough is enough. Right now, a girl has access to free medical legal, and you and I can make that difference. So that's the work that each and everyone has been able to support and to bring to life. And as you can see, it just, one person starts something and the next person gets on because we all have that connection. We each can affect the next person. So we always have to start where we are with the next person we're with, just a kind act can change the world, even if it's one person. We know research has shown positive psychology shows how we all have those mirroring neurons, that what I'm going through can affect you just by being in close proximity with me. Even just making this eye contact is probably having an effect on you, right? Okay. <laughs> so what is th that is supposed to show how one person's feelings, we don't even know why they're smiling, right? But all of a sudden, the whole room is busting out in laughter. So what we do affects the other person. And who you are and how we treat each other can make a whole room change its energy. After such a really dense and intense thing, everybody was able to laugh because the person across from them is smiling. So I just want us to, and that's what happened, and that's what um, we hear Me Too movement. For me, it was sitting across that nine-year-old and telling her the brave thing to do and how she can heal that brought back, that was me when I was 11. And I was not able to do that for myself. And this little girl gave me that courage to also start my own healing. And as your smile can bring a smile on another person, even when they don't know, that's the same even as somebody being courageous or brave or standing up for the other person can make the rest of the world just come together and stand up for something that's unjust. And we have plenty of those going on, racial and um, women's rights and all of this. So there's always something we can do to make the next person feel loved and kind. So when, for me, when I hear Me Too, and I saw somebody wearing a t-shirt here, shout out. <laughs> um, it wasn't about that Me Too, I'm sexually assaulted kind of thing. It's Me Too, because what affects one person, be it in Uganda, be it in Winchester, or Afghanistan, affects me, because we're all in this together. As humans, the neurons, as you just saw, we affect one another whether we like it or not. So I want you to help me one last time and do something for me. When I say something, I want you all to say me too. Can you do that? Okay. I am brave. Me too. I'm kind. Me too. I can change the world. Me too. I'm an activist. Me too. Starts with me. Me too. I'm gorgeous. Me too. <laughs> I'm kind. Me too. I am worthy. I am enough. I'm ready for a nap. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>